thanks everybody for coming here. I'm really excited to see all the people from, from different parts of the country, different, different backgrounds. Um, and so I'm really excited uh, that you're all here. So uh, thanks, Jason, for the introduction. So my goals today are to talk about a couple of things. The first is, is the problem that, that hopefully will resonate with all of the, the proposals and, and uh, plans that you've been thinking about in coming here, which is the, the problem of dark data extraction. And I'll talk a little bit about that and how we think about that problem and why we see the, the big technical computer science problem to doing this is getting enough training data to train models to do this for us. And I'll talk about um, sort of why that's become such a problem and, and how we think about addressing it. And then uh, I'll spend the rest of my time talking uh, just to introduce Snorkel to you um, and, and how it addresses this fundamental problem. So of course, uh, the thing that we're all interested in accomplishing our task is, is dark data extraction. And, and to explain what I mean by that, uh, when we th I, I want to show, when we think about the landscape of data that's available, that we can, the, uh, you know, the data that we have access to as researchers, it's, it's a little bit like an iceberg in that um, the stuff that's really uh, easy to use, the stuff that's machine readable, things uh, like structured data, are just the tip of the iceberg. So these are things that you can that, that are in a computer readable format that you can load in, let's say, in, in an R data frame and start doing your analysis on right away. But as as I'm sure you, you're all you all know because you're here that they're lurking, you know, kind of beneath the surface of this machine readable stuff is all the really valuable things that our computers can't analyze. Um, right off, right out of the box. So this is everything from scientific articles and government reports to to medical images um, that that you find in in electronic health records. And so as uh, as we'll talk about, a lot of times the the really interesting stuff, the stuff that can move the needle on research projects, are actually locked away in these things that are really written for humans, not for computers. And so we've got this problem that there's value in this, in this data, but it's very hard to process. And so the problem of dark data extraction is to take all of this dark data, the text, the tables, the images that are in our unstructured data, and turn it into structured data that we can do analysis on. So these are things like uh, relational tables, graphs. You know, there's lots of ways to think about this. But at bottom, it's something that we can run our queries over. It's something that we can uh, d begin to do an analysis on. And the reason we've been thinking about this problem here at, uh, in our research group is because uh, we see it over and over again as really a critical and, and difficult step that comes before a lot of the really exciting research. Uh, it's, it's a prerequisite that a lot of people face when they want to start to answer questions, for example, in biomedical research. And so this is where we want to, to, um, to, to try to ease this process and, and, and make this a little bit easier to do. So in our group, we've been thinking about a, a couple of problems, a couple of, of applications. Um, and hopefully this will get you started to think about kind of the range of things that you can approach with this perspective. And um, one of the first things we've been working on is extracting information from clinical health records. So here at Stanford, um, Rusty Hoffman, who's pictured here, he's the head of interventional radiology at Stanford. And he works on deep vein thrombosis. And so his, his approach to treating this is to use uh, arterial catheters to, to actually open up the veins. But because there haven't been randomized clinical trials to, to address questions like, what types of catheters should we use for which patients in, in which parts of the body? Which ones are, are the most uh, likely to have um, you know, adverse, rea adverse outcomes? Uh, you know, what are the signs of post-implant surgery issues? These are all things um, that, that researchers don't have a great handle on. And so this information, uh, you know, that we could use to actually address these questions is locked away in electronic health records. And so we've been working with Stanford Medicine to extract this information from uh, electronic health records. Things like which patients uh, have which types of treatments, what were the outcomes, so that we can do this analysis. And this is so important because a lot of that critical data is not coded in a machine readable way. Uh, the, the kind of the rule of thumb that I've heard is that if the insurance company doesn't care about it, it doesn't get coded. It doesn't get written down in a structured way. And so there's all this valuable information that we can extract. Um, and other things that we've been thinking about uh, are extractions from the scientific literature, other projects like this. Um, you know, we've been working with FDA and the Helix Group. Um, 
uh, Farm GKB is, is another project in this space. Um, and so we want to answer questions like, what drugs may have unsafe reactions with gut bacteria? Or which genes are associated with which phenotypes? And so a lot of people mentioned PubMed today. These are the types of questions that we want to build models to, to answer um, by actually looking for facts in, uh, in the scientific literature. And uh, again, this, this challenge is really pressing because with things like PubMed, scientific data is, is broadly accessible, but it's still not machine readable. We can't uh, easily put it into a computer and have a computer analyze the contents of these reports. And so we want to get around the problem of having uh, a human have to sit and read these papers to figure out what the valuable information is. Uh, and we've even been working on some things that are a little farther afield from biomedicine, so applications like defense and law enforcement. Um, in collaboration with the Hoover Institution here at Stanford, we've been working on questions like, what causes insurgency fighters to join insurgencies or leave them? And, and believe it or not, this is also a dark data extraction problem because uh, some researchers here, uh, it, they've collected um, reports. So in true government fashion, uh, there's uh, governments, when they have uh, encounters with these militias, they write up reports. And so these, these researchers have decades of reports going back uh, about all of their encounters with these various uh, insurgent militias, and they want to analyze them to look for patterns. Uh, we've also been involved in the fight against human trafficking um, by doing uh, dark data extraction on online sex ads. So building up databases of, of this material that law enforcement agencies can actually search and use as part of their investigations. And so again, all of these things that, that, the, that, the research, that the domain researchers are interested in, you know, what causes insurgency fighters to join up? What, you know, where, what are the patterns in human trafficking? These all have to be done on top of structured data. And so first th the first thing that comes up is how do we get that information from the reports, from the online ads, into a database that the researchers can analyze. Um, and I, I want to um, just underline that, that uh, this system is uh, we're uh, actively under research and we're starting to expand into things beyond text. And so we're very interested in everything from, from images to time series, other types of unstructured data that we could get value out of. Um, and so one of the examples of, of work in this direction is uh, a paper that um, uh, some people in our lab co-authored with uh, Kuhn, uh, who's now a postdoc at Harvard, and he, uh, he was a med student here at Stanford. And so he looked at pathology images for in um, uh, lung cancer patients and built up a system that extracted out um, visual features and built a system that could predict prognosis better than human experts. And the idea here was that by combining these images with the patient data, the, the semi-structured patient data and electronic health records, he could outperform expert pathologists at this early prognosis prediction problem that was really challenging. So one thing that, that came, that kind of emerged from this work on, on these dark data extraction problems is the need for uh, what we call lightweight extraction. So, uh, some of these, these projects were really exciting, but the, the challenge in building them is that oftentimes uh, building these dark data extraction systems, uh, especially in the earlier generations, took months or even years of human effort. And we started to look at, you know, uh, well, first of all, I should say that that's, that's, you know, we think we can do better. That's not really acceptable, right? Because um, you all are trying to answer questions at a faster pace than that, right? We want to be able to build systems that can usefully answer questions, ideally in hours to days, and hopefully we'll take a step towards that today. Um, but the question, it, you know, that we faced as computer science researchers was, what was holding us back? What makes it hard to, dif uh, what makes it difficult to build these dark data extraction systems that, um, that produce these results? And so to answer that question, I want to um, take a first step towards, towards diving into the details and move on to a, uh, an example application that we can actually start to think about. Uh, and hopefully, you know, it, this will already start kind of the wheels turning. You'll be able to see how some of the problems that you're interested in might map onto, onto, onto this uh, example application. Uh, and so this is something that we've been working on. Uh, this is a benchmark task we've been working on at Circle. And the goal is to extract uh, 
chemicals and associated adverse diseases or, or diseases that, that can be induced by that chemical from PubMed abstracts. And so this is a, a, a benchmark task that was put out by the NIH. So they released a data set. Um, and, and our work on this is all available on the website, but we'll, you know, just in case people are more curious about that. But the idea here is I've got uh, a PubMed title and a PubMed abstract, and um, the resolution isn't so great, so I'll just, you know, tell me something's unclear, but I'll try to point out the, uh, the key parts. And so the way that we approach this problem is we start by tagging the, the chemicals and the diseases that we see mentioned in this abstract. And so for the purposes of this example, we'll assume that this is done for us because in bioinformatics, um, we find that a lot of times there's been a lot of work on uh, this stage of the pipeline. Now, there are a lot of other domains that we've worked on where this is not necessarily the case. So we can relax this assumption if it, if it doesn't fit into your, uh, your use case. Don't worry, we can, we can talk more about that. But for this example, we'll assume that we can do a good job of tagging all the mentions. We can go through and we can see magnesium, acetylcholine, uh, I guess those are the two types of chemicals in this. Uh, and then we also have the disease tagged, like preeclampsia, mysanthia gravis, things like that. And so now the task that we want to do, our goal is to populate a table of the chemicals that the text says cause certain diseases. And so if I flip back and forth between these two slides, you'll see that there's lots of, of mentions of chemicals and diseases. But only some of them, this is, this is the, the ground truth, this is the thing that we're interested in producing, only, only a small subset of those pairs of chemicals and diseases are actually related in the text. So what we've done is we've boiled this down to a classification problem. If I flip back to all the entity mentions, what I want to do is say, for each pair of these, yes or no, does the text say that they're related? And if I do a good job of this, I'll be able to fill a table of these pairs. And I'll come up with things like magnesium, uh, you know, as the title says, um, was associated with inducing mysanthia gravis. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. But, um, right, and so that's, that's the classification that we're, that we're uh, interested in solving. So now I'm going to dive in a little bit to think about how do we approach this problem from a machine learning perspective? How can we train a machine to actually answer this yes-no question for us? And um, the way that, that we do this is we build a pipeline and, and uh, break it down into several steps. And so the first thing uh, sometimes we refer to as candidate extraction. And so here, we're defining candidates as all the things that we want to answer, that we want to make a prediction for. So in this case, it's going to be all the pairs of chemicals and diseases that we've tagged in the text. So for this, um, and we might, one thing that we'll probably do uh, today is, is break it down by sentence, just, just to make things a little bit easier. But that's not a, a strict assumption. So for all the pairs of chemicals and diseases that I see in a sentence, are they related? So is, is this uh, d you know, disease associated with this chemical? And, and so on for all these pairs. That's candidate extraction. And the next thing we'll do um, is, or at least the next thing that, that is often done in machine learning is that, a training, that we create a training set, right? We look at these, these possible candidates and we ask a human expert, um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people here have, have uh, experience annotating data, uh, probably not super pleasant experiences of annotating data. Um, but you know, this is the thing that comes next in the pipeline is going through and having a human expert on some training set mark which ones are actually true and which ones are not uh, expressed in the text. And from there, um, uh, in machine learning, one thing that uh, we often or that, that we have to do next is this thing called feature extraction or feature creation. And so what we want to do is give the machine lots of little bits of information that it can use to make these predictions. Things like what are the key words that or what are the words that we see between the two entities that are in the candidate. So like you know for this for this uh, disease and this chemical, what are the key, what are the words between it? What are the words on either side of the disease? What are other, on on either side of the chemical? Things like that. Uh, and this can be another laborious uh, process. And finally, once you've done all of that, then you can load it into, into some off-the-shelf uh, classification library and uh, learn parameters and, and you know, actually do the machine learning to learn to predict back these, these, um, these decisions. 
So what's so hard about doing this? Where do people get stuck when they go to build these systems? Well, it used to be, um, you know, several years ago, uh, I would say, um, or sorry, I should, I should say, start by saying that the reality is that if you can get all the way to the end of this pipeline, usually you're in great shape. That machine learning, these, these models that we use to make prediction have become such a commodity that if you get all of your training data in order and you've got some feature ex features uh, for your data created, it's not that hard to actually you know, run the algorithm to learn the, to learn the model. So that's not where we spend a lot of time. Um, so what about feature extraction? So it used to be that this is where machine learning people would get hung up on. They, you know, and and if, you've, if you've worked with any systems, um, any machine reading systems, maybe you spent some time actually doing this, uh, and, and you know, then you know it's very time consuming. So this used to be the bottleneck. But if people have, have been um, you know, following what's been going on in machine learning, you've probably heard about deep learning and, and deep neural networks, this thing that everyone's excited about. And the reason that they're so excited about this is because it gets around this problem of feature engineering. Now you don't have to tell the computer to look at you know, these edges in a picture or these keywords in a sentence. You can feed in raw, uh, raw pixels or raw characters, raw, or raw words into your model, and it can do well. And it automatically learns this feature representation. So this is not something that we have to do anymore in, in machine learning. But there's a trade-off now. When we look at the next stage in our pipeline, when we look at creating that training set, we've paid a price for these fancy deep learning models that get great performance without any hand engineering. They now, because they have so many parameters to learn all about your data and learn good feature representations, we need massive training sets to get good performance. And so now this has become the bottleneck in machine learning. And as I'm sure you all know, this is really expensive, particularly when domain expertise is required. A lot of graduate students, a lot of researchers have spent uh, you know, uh, years, in some cases, really curating and annotating the data that they need to just to answer their, their analysis question. And on top of that, once you've, once you've created that data set, it's fixed, right? You've put in this big investment. And now let's say the task that you want to do changes ever so slightly. Well, potentially, you might have to go back and relabel a lot more data. Um, and so that's really expensive. So for, for this reason, um, if people have been saying that data is the new oil in machine learning, sometimes we, we like to say around here that training data is, is actually the new, new oil, because it's, it's really what is the most valuable input into the machine learning pipeline. So hopefully this has motivated the question, what can we do to get around this bottleneck? Can we use things that are uh, less expensive to obtain than hand-labeled training data, but maybe not as high quality, and still create good machine learning models? And hopefully we'll convince you in the next couple of days that the answer is yes. And that's where Snorkel comes in. And so Snorkel is an open source system that you know, we've been developing to, to address this training data bottleneck. And the idea is that by modeling our training set creation process, by modeling all of the rules of thumb, the heuristics that, that uh, human annotators use when they actually annotate a, dating set, da a data set, if we model that as a statistical process, we can actually combine low quality sources, things that are less expensive to obtain than hand labeled data, and combine them to train high quality models. And so we're going to, I think over the next hour or two, we're going to slowly unpack this, this one sentence definition in more and more detail. I'll give kind of a, a high level overview of the pipeline, and then we'll start digging deeper and deeper into what this process looks like. But to skip ahead, the results are that we've gotten state-of-the-art performance on a number of benchmark tasks in machine reading and other dark data extraction problems, as well as some interesting new applications without using any hand-labeled training data. And so we'll talk a lot about the resources um, that are available for Snorkel, but I, and I, I, I bet everyone's seen this already, but I always like to put in a plug here just for our website where um, you, you know, there's, there's links that, to all the papers and all the blog posts and all the tutorials. Um, so it's a great place uh, to get more information. Um, and so we're really excited because people in research and industry and, and government have all started to use Snorkel um, uh, as, as part of their own research. 
And, and one of the reasons that we're, we're excited, we think that, that you know, this is uh, starting to catch on, is because we've really focused on how can we get domain experts in the loop. We've, we've tried to focus on that, I think, more than, than other machine reading systems have. And so today we'll be talking about how to use the Jupyter Notebook interface that Snorkel is built around. And so the idea is, is to get, get you all programming very quickly uh, on, to, to build these models. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you just kind of the first taste of what that, what that programming looks like. What's different about using Snorkel from, from other machine reading systems and other, other machine learning systems. So the big difference is that rather than hand labeling data, Snorkel asks you to write these things called labeling functions. And these labeling functions are just little snippets of code that produce a label for, an in, uh, for a, a piece of, uh, of data that you give as input. So thinking back to that chemical disease relation task that we were, that we were thinking about, um, if we think of one of those candidates that we're interested in classifying, we've got a chemical and a disease that we've identified in a sentence. The job of a labeling function is to say, yes, that is a mention of a, of a chemical disease relation. No, it isn't, or I don't know. And so here's a really simple example of one. Uh, and all it does is it applies a regular expression to that sentence that contains the two mentions. And it looks, uh, hopefully you can see here, that it looks for the word caused anywhere in the sentence. This is a real simple one. And if we see the word caused somewhere in that sentence, it's going to say, yes, that is a true mention. Otherwise, it's going to say, I don't know. And this really simple idea that we can encode these heuristics as as little snippets of code, uh, it actually generalizes a lot of ways that people have thought about doing, about supervising, about teaching machine learning models. And so it can, ca it can capture a lot of things, um, uh, some of which you might already be familiar with, you know, all these domain heuristics that you can encode as, as things like regular expressions. Uh, people who've worked on machine reading might be familiar with distance supervision, where you use an existing knowledge base to supervise a, a machine learning model. You can also write uh, distance supervision as labeling functions. We'll talk about that. And even some other things that might not be as obvious uh, a fit that other people have used, things like crowdsourcing, when you've got multiple workers and you don't know sort of who to trust the most, or weak classifiers where you've trained uh, models directly on really noisy data. All of these things are, are, are things that Snorkel can take as inputs and use to improve the quality of your model. But to, to, to see how we do that, we have, to, we have to grapple with this really fundamental problem. And that is that these labeling functions are noisy. And, by, and so what I mean by that is if we look at this example here, we have some input sentence that says, in our study administering chemical A caused disease B under certain conditions, then we're going to apply this labeling function, let's say for example. And because we see the word caused in it, the labeling function is going to say true. Yes, that sentence actually says that A caused B. And oftentimes, it's going to get the right answer. But immediately, you can think of lots of cases where it's going to be wrong, right? A sentence could say, a recent study found no evidence that chemical A caused disease B. And so our labeling function is still going to say true. That's the correct answer. But it's going to be wrong. It's going to be incorrect. And so the question is, how can we take all of these functions that are giving us answers, but they're making mistakes, how can we combine them to produce a good enough training data set that we can train a high quality model? And at bottom, that's what Snorkel does in a process that we call data programming. So I'll give you a, a high level overview of what this, what this pipeline looks like. And, and again, this is, the, this is kind of a, a template for what the, what the entire day is going to uh, be, is going, is going to be stepping through this pipeline. So uh, the way that data programming works in Snorkel is that, uh, is that you all, the domain experts, write labeling functions. And so the key here is that it's not, just, it's not just one labeling function that we have. It's many different labeling functions. And we'll talk more about this, but you know, on, on some of the state-of-the-art applications that we have, we've seen this, the number that you need range anywhere from 10 to 100, usually closer to 10. Um, and so that, just to give you an idea of kind of the order of magnitude that we're talking about here. And all of these, these labeling functions can capture different heuristics, different regular expressions, different pieces of domain knowledge um, that, that you come up with that is particular to your task. 
And that's the input to snorkel. And so the next thing that happens is that we use a statistical model to combine the outputs of these labeling functions. And I won't uh, uh, dive into too much of the details right now, but I'll just say that the way we think about this problem as a statistical problem is we assume that there's, one, that there's some true label, that there's some answer to the question that all of these labeling functions are giving us information about. But we don't know what it is. We never get to see it. And what we do is we build a model that relates that latent variable to all the outputs that we do get to observe. And intuitively, this is, uh, we, we can learn, or excuse me, what we can do is we can learn how accurate each one of these labeling functions are. Intuitively, you can think of this like a panel of experts. Let's say you've got a bunch of experts sitting in front of you and you want to figure out, uh, you don't know who the smartest expert is, but you, you want to estimate it. And you assume that they're not guessing randomly, you assume that they know what they're talking about, but some are better than others. Well, what you can do is you can ask them a question. And if all your experts agree on the answer, you'll be really confident that that's the right answer. But if they, if they uh, don't all agree with each other, if they disagree, like if they, if they split in a tie, then you won't really be sure what the true answer is. And now if you ask them many questions, you can start to see who votes with the majority the most often and who's often conflicting with the others. And from there you can start to back out statistically who the most accurate experts are. That's in a nutshell exactly what this statistical model is doing. It's estimating uh, which of these, of these experts, these heuristics, are actually uh, uh, the most accurate and learns how to weight them to combine them all into, into one true label. And from there what we do is we want a model that can actually generalize beyond the heuristics that we encoded in these labeling functions. We want a model that can uh, learn to read lots of different types of text. And so what we do is we feed all of this information into an end model that we want to train to do machine reading. So oftentimes, like today, what we'll do is we'll use a, a deep neural network that's uh, state of the art for this kind of machine reading problem. And what we do is we feed these labels that we've estimated along with the raw text into this model. And it actually learns how to do the reading task. And from there, we can output this trained model as, as, uh, as a module, as something that you can then go on to use um, in, in, in applications independent of the snorkel system that created it. So we'll talk about um, uh, sort of performance numbers, things like that, a little bit later. But um, I just want to give you kind of a, a, a teaser for, you know, what's the point of doing all this, right? Why not just use one of those labeling functions at, to produce some training labels and see what you get? Well, this is something that we've been studying very actively. And just as a taste of some of the results that we've seen, this is... Uh, this table is comparing uh, the difference between using just a distance supervision uh, labeling function, something that, that would, you would use maybe a few years ago if you were doing machine reading, versus uh, a model trained in snorkel. And so across these different machine reading tasks, so news articles, genomics information from PubMed, pharma, pharmacological information from PubMed, we see consistent um, uh, improvements of, of several F1 points, um, you know, ranging from you know, a half up to, up to almost five, uh, just by modeling the accuracy of these sources. By combining this, infor this information, we can improve the precision and recall of the model that we train. So to wrap up, uh, I think we're all, it's fair to say we're all excited about this dark data extraction task. That's really what we want to tackle today. And we can make some headway on this task if, if we've got a system that lets us build a machine reading model quickly. And the key bottleneck to doing that is having enough training data. If we can get that, then, then modern machine learning techniques can take us pretty much the rest of the way. And so what we'll be working on today is getting around this training data bottleneck by generating noisier training data and then using modeling to improve its quality. Thank you.
Days. Um, the rule of thumb is usually tens of thousands, and so uh, at just at a bare minimum. So even sort of state-of-the-art uh, things like ImageNet that people, like the, the benchmark tasks that the deep learning researchers are competing over can go up to millions. At a bare minimum, tens of thousands, and that's the scale that we'll be working with in the example today. And so, absolutely, there's a big difference. So, um, in, uh, as I mentioned, the number of labeling functions that we need for good performance usually is on the order of 10 to 100. And so, we've seen people uh, be able to write those in a, in a, in a day or two. Um, versus features, uh, state-of-the-art machine learning models can have uh, potentially millions of features, right? And, and the, the idea there is that you're going to throw in absolutely everything you can possibly think of and then use training data to figure out which ones are the most predictive, right? So the goals are a little bit different. That's why it, feature engineering is very laborious, but uh, writing labeling functions um, is, is often much less so. Yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. So, so one of the, the first things that you see, uh, as, as I'm sure you've seen in machine reading, is that uh, there's a big class imbalance problem. So oftentimes, the true facts in, that, in, that, in, a, in a document are much sparser than all the possible facts that we could pull out. And this is another reason why you need such large labeled training sets, because it can take lots and lots of labeled data just to get enough positive examples to really capture the concept that you're looking for. So again, noisy labeling is helpful because you can apply these labeling functions over very large, uh, very large unlabeled corpora. You can, you can uh, potentially pull in millions of documents and, and find more examples of positive classes. So if, and, and actually, we're, we're very excited about this, right? So now we're relying on, on you all, the domain experts, to input this domain knowledge. But we think there's a lot of interesting research questions. How can you glean this automatically from, from things that, from resources that you have in your domain, like ontologies, existing annotations? How can you, how can you create these things even by uh, watching experts as they work? But that's, that's a little bit sci-fi. That's kind of uh, our research agenda for the next few years. Uh, for the next, next few days, we'll be talking about how can you, how can you program them by hand.